I can't, I think Kai is muted, so I can't tell. Yep, we are now recording. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Um, so anyway, I just wanted um, to start with a living land acknowledgement. I know some of you have heard this before, and I apologize for that. It does change um, with time, but um, I think especially tonight, um, because it is focused on relationships. And a living land acknowledgement is something where you um, take a, a, some time and reflect on how your about um, land acknowledgements um, have changed over time. And um, so, yeah, so that's where we are. Um, hang on, I just need to move this on my screen. Okay. I woke up to the paralyzing climate science in 2013 when I stopped thinking about global warming and began to understand the climate crisis. My focus was on the future we've created for ourselves and I got active and began organizing and I wanted everyone to wake up and act to avoid this catastrophic and violent future that we will leave uh, to the generations that follow us. At that time, I understood land acknowledgements as a respectful way to begin gatherings and I would say that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples and that we acknowledge this as an expression of gratitude and appreciation for those whose territory we reside on and as a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Over time and through new and beautiful relationships with some of the original people of this land and through deeply thinking about the root causes of the multiple crisis we are facing, I began to see such acknowledgements as an opportunity to invite others to think about and reflect on what we, on, sorry, reflect on the systems and structures that have caused the injustice that surrounds us and that we continue to benefit from at the expense of others. I learned about the treaties and promises that were made and broken and I realized that we are living on stolen land. I would say that land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context and that colonialism is a current and ongoing process and that we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. I would say that we are on stolen land and I would say that the climate crisis is a crisis whose symptoms are ecological, but whose root causes lie in an economy structurally ill-equipped to respect land, labor, and human dignity. And as I spend more time with the uh, knowledge keepers, the Medeowin, the storytellers, and the water walkers, and more time on the land and with the water, understanding my life in relation to all life on Earth and to the water that sustains us, I have come to appreciate that climate change isn't a technological problem or an economic problem. It is at its core a relationship problem resulting in, from a breakdown in our relationships with each other and with the land. This is a crisis that can best be addressed through relational worldview, a worldview that characterized, characterized by the concept of a circle interconnectedness and the connection to place, a worldview based on respect, reciprocity, responsibility, and relationships. And now I ask people to think about the worldview that got us here and the worldview we will need to get us out of this mess. And I say, I'd like to begin this gathering with a statement of gratitude to and political acknowledgement of the indigenous caretakers of this land. And now I say that the, this is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples who exist in deep reciprocal relationship with not only the land and the waterways, but also with the physical and spiritual forces that connect them to this place, their place of creation in an intimate and meaningful way. Now, when I offer land acknowledgement, I express my gratitude to the land and to all life on earth. And I invite others to learn from, listen humbly to, and take our cues from what the first people of these lands are telling us to do, to do whatever work we are doing in solidarity with the original peoples of this land and to actively support land back campaigns. And I acknowledge that our lives and our work reflect the privilege of benefiting from the removal of indigenous peoples from their territory. And that we commit to using that privilege toward restitution and reconciliation. Land acknowledgements are an essential and respectful way to begin gatherings. And I've come to understand that they are much more than that. Land acknowledgements are a local place-based response to multiple global crises and an opportunity to help us to begin to heal our relationships with one another and with all life on earth. Thanks. So that's our acknowledgement. Um, my name is Laura Hamilton and I'm a member of Divest Waterloo. We've been working for, um, well, since about 2013 to create awareness about the climate crisis and to encourage individuals and institutions to move our collective financial resources away from the fossil fuel industry 
and toward the creation of a more livable and just society. The West Waterloo is committed to climate justice and is the local chapter of Faith in the Common Good, a national interfaith charitable network founded in 2000 on the belief that our diverse faith congregations and spiritual communities can be powerful role models for the common good. Faith in the Common Good supports diverse faith and spiritual communities to contribute toward greener, healthier, more resilient neighborhoods. And Faith in the Common Good is sponsoring our Faith Food Forest Project, which you're all here to learn about this evening. So this evening, we're going to have several excellent speakers. First up is Michelle Singh, who's the Executive Director of Faith in the Common Good. Born into an interfaith family, Michelle Singh Oops. has a deep understanding and appreciation of the world's rich spiritual and cultural diversity. Michelle spent more than 30 years working in the IT and communication sectors before 2008. Whoops, someone's not muted. Uh, in 2008, when she became an ordained faith minister from the New York Seminary in New York, or sorry, from the New Seminary in New York. Since then, she's been actively engaged in Canada's interfaith movement, including vice chairing the award-winning World Interfaith Harmony Week Steering Committee and co-founding a multi-faith spiritual dialogue circle. Uh, Michelle is also a board member and steering, uh, and steering committee co-chair of the 2018 Parliament of the World's Religions, overseeing the world's largest interfaith gathering, featuring a thousand diverse spiritual programs um, attended by over 8,500 people. Michelle became the executive director of Faith in the Common Good in 2020. She's also an efficient and well-known for intuitive listening and her ability to create safe and sacred spaces for processing and dialogue. Michelle excels at bringing diverse groups of people together to achieve a common goal. And I'm very grateful to Michelle's support and guidance on this project. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to tell you uh, a little bit more about the good work uh, that, uh, that you're doing uh, at Faith in the Common Good. Thank you, Laura, for that lovely introduction. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all here. Laura has given you a bit of a background about faith in the common good, and it just struck me that we're turning 21 this year. So we're coming into our own and uh, continuing to work to harness the power of diverse faith and spiritual groups through education, capacity building, and collective action. I just want to tell you a little bit about some of our programming so you have an idea of uh, some of the projects that we have, uh, have done in the past. And I'll also put some links in the chat box if, uh, in case there's something you want to explore a little bit further. As Laura mentioned, Divest Waterloo is um, one of our chapters of Greeting Sacred Spaces, which is our longest running program that really connects faith groups with local nonprofit, municipal and commercial organizations who are all dedicated to a sustainable future. The power of Greeting Sacred Spaces is that it's a practical program because it assists faith communities with both the educational and spiritual dimensions of greening, as well as the how-to side of audits, retrofits, and generally reducing a faith community's footprint. Now, given that buildings account for about 42% of a typical faith community's carbon footprint, and that there are really over 27,000 faith buildings across Canada, energy benchmarking is helping faith communities take practical and economical climate action by lowering their energy use and emissions. Faith in the Common Good is the delivery partner for the United Church of Canada's Faithful Footprints program. It's a five-year program. We've just entered the third year. It's the only one of its kind in Canada. Within UCC, 3,000 buildings are eligible, and UCC has a commitment to engage with 500 um, properties by 2025 and reducing their GHC emissions 80% by 2050. The, the program started with building energy, uh, energy efficiency, lowering carbon footprint, looking at the largest uh, fixed cost for congregations. 
And to date, we've had uh, over 190 congregations across the, the country participate. UCC also has a strong climate justice conti contingent. Uh, they advocate for grid changes and faith sector impact and collaborate with other faith-based organizations so that the sector can come together in advocacy work. Another of our programs is Greening Canadian Moss. We're in the process of developing a toolkit that's specifically designed for Canadian moss to improve their sustainable practices, reduce carbon emissions and reduce costs. And the overall objective is really to understand what kind of unique support moss need to embed sustainability in their operations and provide the tools they need to identify, track and deliver resource efficiency operations, opportunities. Um, the Canadian arm of the glo global Catholic climate movement is also a part of our network. Their focus is on working with Catholics across Canada to respond to Pope Francis's urgent call for social, political, and ecological transformation. In April and May, GCCM Canada is offering a series of webinars that are focused on Canadian Catholic divest, reinvest uh, movement. And it seeks to harmonize Catholic values with Catholic held investments. I'll put the link for that in case anyone is interested in attending those, um, those free webinars. I also wanted to mention uh, there are two initiatives that Faith of the Common Good is involved with. One is for the love of creation, which I'm sure um, a lot of you are, are familiar with. It's a faith-based climate initiative that invites Canadian faith communities and faith-based organizations to come together under a unified banner to mobilize education, reflection, action, and advocacy for climate justice. And I'm sure some of you heard of Sacred People, Sacred Earth, the, uh, the Global Day of Climate Action that was on March 11th. Um, faith on the Common Good is also a founding partner of Green Faith International, of the Green Faith International Network, which seeks to accelerate the growth and influence of the religious environmental movement. The event on March 11th was extraordinary. There were over 420 actions in 49 countries. We had support from over 250 religious leaders around the world and 125 co-sponsoring organizations that, we, that represented more than 100 million people. It's an extraordinary time to be doing the work that we're doing and having the impact that we can have as people of faith coming together, standing up for our environment and for climate justice. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Thanks, Michelle. That's wonderful. So much good work that you're doing. Um, I'm just, I was in email briefly. There's a lot of people sending quick notes saying that they can't get in. So I will attend to those in a minute. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to be part of the Faith in the Common Good Network. It's been uh, a great ride. I think we've been doing, we've been working together since 2016, 20, maybe 2015. Anyway, it's been wonderful and thank you. Um, and now I would like to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, my friend Mukla Musa, uh, Dr. Andrew Judge, is a beautiful, gentle soul who does amazing work. He's presently an assistant professor of Anishinaabeg studies at Algoma University, uh, Shingwak Kinemagegek Nick. I probably didn't do that well, and I'm sorry. And as a session, and he's also worked as a session, sessional lecturer. See, I have trouble with English words too. Um, as a sessional lecturer at Laurier and at the University of Waterloo. And he was also the coordinator of Indigenous studies at Conestoga College. He specializes in traditional indigenous knowledge, ethnomedicine, and land-based learning. Uh, Muki Mosa has learned from and worked and consulted with and served indigenous elders and community leaders for over a decade. 
He's founded several community-led indigenous-based knowledge programs at elementary, secondary, and post-secondary levels, and works tirelessly, tirelessly to promote land-based education. He's focused on supporting conscious awakening to, the, uh, to respond to the current state in society in using Anishinaabe teachings, and he's initiated as a Mayan day keeper and participates in the ancient ceremonial practices of his Anishinaabe ancestors, ancestors, the Medellin. Over, over to you, Andrew. And Andrew's also going to be um, looking at questions in the chat. So. Buju, Ani, Mokomase uh, Indigo, the spirit calls me Mokomase, Bear Walker. Um, um, Anishinaabe, Anini, um, Indal, I'm an Anishinaabe man. Deshkanzibi and Donjiba. I was raised, I was born and raised along the Horn of the Serpent River, present day uh, London, Ontario. Um, and thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I hope that some of you have the um, uh, audacity uh, to take action after today uh, because we need everybody that we can to move their body in a new way on this earth uh, because the way that we've been moving is all of us uh, is uh, quite damaging destructive and uh, but i don't want to make this too bleak um uh, of course some of you might know me some of you might not uh, um, I am very tired, so tirelessly is a bit of an overstatement. I was up real early. We've been running in the sugar bush out here in the uh, Bauting. I live in present-day Sault Ste. Marie. This was a, a gathering place for Indigenous peoples uh, from across the land for generations. So I have some uh, slides that I'm going to share with you in a presentation on climate change and taking action. Uh, please listen as best as you can um, try to be present if you're overwhelmed at any moment uh, try and take a breath um, a deep breath into the nose and out through the mouth and uh, go to the place of the heart rather than the place of the mind that um, can uh, cause some challenges so um, this is a meditation on remembering it what it means to be human and that is what the Anishinaabe people, that is what I teach as an Anishinaabe Nini, as an Anishinaabe man. Um, we are a people who lived from the heart. Um, and I'll go into that, the details of that, because that's what this is really about. Uh, and it's, it's, it's so much more than that. But Two of my teachers, one from uh, Central America in the highlands of Guatemala, Tata Ushla Hutnoch. Of course, I was initiated by him about eight years ago, and I did ceremony this morning in honor of that initiation. Um, today is uh, nine uh, emosh, nine being a number uh, relevant to the divine power of the woman. And Imosh is the collective consciousness, the place that we all originate, that collective swamp where we all came from. But uh, him and Onabinese, uh, Jim Dumont, uh, incredible Anishinaabe elder, have both said the same thing by connecting the mind to the heart. You can unlock the secrets of the universe. So I just really encourage you for the next, whatever I have, 30 minutes or so, to rather than try to interpret what I'm saying, try to absorb what I'm saying um, into the space of the heart. Because if your, cons if your mind's going to go, you're going to forget everything. And then um, these are seeds. These are seeds. This knowledge is powerful. It has guided my life has transformed me as a person and continues to transform me as a person. And we always, uh, we all, I was given that warning, you know, that this knowledge is powerful. We can use it to do good and we can also use it to cause harm. So where do you live? 
<clears throat> Hopefully, a lot of you are in that uh, southwestern Ontario region there. I'm just uh, moving the camera so I don't get distracted. Um, there's a story that's just almost never been told to the people of southwestern Ontario. And that is that you live in a land that was originally uh, an engineered landscape, the entire thing. In fact, from about Guelph through to Kitchener, down to London, into Niagara Falls, Windsor, all the way down to the Carolinas, there was uh, a, an essential paradise when um, colonizers arrived. In fact, when they arrived, they didn't see anybody. And they thought it was a terra nullius. And in fact, it was a, a completely habited, habited land designed by indigenous people over a hundred generations or more um, to produce uh, an abundance unlike you or I have ever or will ever see in our lifetimes. And that is because um, the first wave, the first pandemics that swept across our nations uh, killed approximately 90% of our populations between um, 1500 and 1600 when the first treaty with our fish was broken. And the um, true intention of the colonizers that arrived became apparent. But when they still arrived, even 100 years later, there were still massive civilizations, tens of thousands of people living throughout Southwestern Ontario and far, far beyond, um, trading amongst each other. And I want you to just picture this for a second because it, you know, I need you to get out of your head this idea of the primitive Indian, this idea that we were these, you know, Brown people with long hair roaming around in the forest with diapers on looking for the next thing to kill. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. Our civilizations had adapted to the places in which they thrived over generations through uh, um, engineering our environment, not for the benefit of the human. In fact, the human benefit came last. Our relationship to our brothers and our sisters, the plants and the animals, the trees, the sky, the earth, and the bones of our ancestors has a story which almost no one has been told in, in North America. And how do I know this? Because I work on the land. I've seen the ancient oaks that are still in Southwestern Ontario, the few remaining ancient oaks, you know, three, 400 years, there's only a few left. All the rest have been cut down. All the sweet chestnut have been cut down. The 200 foot tall sweet chestnuts that produced, you know, 5,000 pounds of food every season or in the seasons that they did. Um, there are 65 species of uh, trees in the Carolinian zone, uh, for 1,200 species of medicines, um, you know, so many plants, so many birds, so many animals, uh, so many fish in just uh, the, the lake or the river that I grew up on. There's 94 species of fish. What I want you to realize is that the people who were destroyed there, who were, in, who were attempted to be annihilated, we knew them all. We knew every single one. Um, we had mastered our environment and our consciousness was so attuned uh, that just the glimpses that I've experienced is, um, to give you an example, I think it was yesterday morning, I dreamt that I was, uh, I was either a whale or a dolphin, but I was the whale or the dolphin, I'm not sure. And I was, um, and this is connected to the talk on Sunday with um, Autumn and Stephanie Peltier, Autumn Peltier being an icon and a water protector recognized around the world. Uh, she spoke to our community here and uh, she, 
we talked about the importance of the water and protecting it and recognizing that we've poisoned almost every single river that we've touched. Um, but I was, I was this whale and I was uh, diving down deep into the water and swimming up fast, breaching the water and psh, blowing out my blowhole. It was, you know, an, an over and over. Psh, and so that is the kind of experiences that I have um, regularly. Um, and I believe it is because I've awakened to the truth of what it means to be a human. And uh, I, th I believe that in order to go past, to go even further, so that all of us can experience the beauty of creation, um, we have to do more. And so what were some of the plants grown in this space? Well, just take a look at the list. The bones of the ancestors found in southwestern Ontario are some of the healthiest bones to ever be found in the entire world. We had engineered a landscape that included these multiple layers, not that magically grew, we designed them. We designed them with the idea that all of our relatives should thrive, not just us. And we knew that if we allowed our relatives to thrive, like the cattails and the puffballs and the hazelnuts and the acorns and the elderberry and the strawberry and the wild rice and the wild carrot and the wild plum, and we say this word wild today because we, uh, the colonized mind positions these things as outside of the human consciousness when in fact we adapted with these things over time with these, with these relatives, these relations. And when we eat these um, um, relatives, when we consume them, because in our story, they gave and give up their lives for our thriving. That's what they do. That's how they um, love us. And all that they ask is that we don't take too much from them. Their civilizations like the potato and the beans and the hickory nut and the brambleberry and the choke cherry have just as much of a right to thrive as us. And let's face it, we're not thriving anymore. So take this list down, look at it. And when you look at this list, um, you know, it can be a little bit overwhelming. This is just, this is just, you have a very abbreviated list of what's uh, provided you in the region where you live and where I live for a lot of time. Um, but what I want you to recognize is that the indigenous people who are living here, uh, for example, the Chinatan, and I'll just go back living in Kitchener, of course. Uh, oh, I can't even remember Strasburg Creek, I think. Is that the right creek? Or I'm pretty sure it's Strasburg or somewhere in Kitchener, anyways. They just found a village and they, you know, they didn't uncover it. They didn't want to tell the truth. But essentially, um, the picture that I want you to have of our civilizations was one where within our communities of these longhouses, you know, 200 longhouses that, and, and, and it would take me like, you know, an hour just to explain the construction of the longhouse and how where the longhouses were built, the community had designed the landscape such that they could harvest in a hundred years from now, the, um, the bows of the ribs of the, the longhouse. They were designing the floor of the longhouse by planting the spruce trees in their region. This was not a, a bunch of, you know, wild people living in the forest marauding around. This was uh, some of the most sophisticated um, connected people uh, to ever live. And, and I don't think we will see that again in my lifetime, but I will do everything that I can to remind people what we are capable of as human beings. And so I was asked today to talk about, you know, an indigenous framework of sustainability, sustainability. and that's really hard to do because of what 
the um, colonized mind has portrayed us as. Right? And I want you to know that if you thought that or you think that and you continue to think that you've been lied to <laughs> and it's sad. It's not just that um, in, indigenous people were stolen from. Everybody was stolen from because of what they stole from us. We could be living in a habitat right now with, with an abundance for all. And I believe that we can recreate it. Um, but it's going to take time. It's going to take dedication and energy. But these strategies, they support in the recovery of indigenous land-based knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge, which has been practiced sustainably throughout Turtle Island by indigenous people for generations. Um, when we practice this knowledge, something happens to your body. How do I know? Because I practice it. Um, something happens to your mind. And I think most importantly, something happens to your heart. Okay? You begin to remember. Okay. So our philosophies as indigenous people are grounded in the understanding that humans in the environment are bound in a relationship of reciprocity, respect, and obligation, not coercion and domination. And if you're wondering why we're in a situation like that now, look to your own actions. You, one has to start at ground zero. And there's a lot of healing to be done, right? So there's a word that we have, ajwe manishna, ajwe manishna. And, and I feel like it's important to sing this song um, to you all who are here uh, present and I wish I could see your faces, all of you. I, I can only see like six of you right now in the corner. Um, but I wish I could see all of your faces uh, when I sing this song. But um, this song has to do with this really important concept that we have as Anishinaabe people. And try and say it if you can, but it's Ajwe Manishna, Jwe Manishna. And when we pray, when we give thanks, we're not just, you know, praying to something out there. We're praying about the things that we have to do, the actions that we have to do. But Ajwe Manishna, Ajwe Manishna is, is basically a conversation with God. And what we're saying to God is, I'm just a human. I'm just a human. Uh, have compassion for me. Some people will say, have pity on me, take pity on me. But I like to say, have compassion for me. And it's not just that we have to have compassion for ourselves. We also have to have compassion for each other, that we're human, that I make mistakes. I make mistakes on the land and my land work. I make mistakes with my family. I make mistakes with my friends with my students. Um, and so it's so easy to point out the mistakes that people make and point at them and say, you've made a mistake. Instead of saying, how can we learn together and grow together from this mistake? How, how can we recognize that I've made a mistake too in my life, sometimes big, sometimes small. Um, and so that's really what this, this word is about. Ajwe uh, Manishna, Ajwe Manishna. So I'm going to just, I'm going to sing this song. And I'm going a little bit off um, the script that I had planned. Uh, but that's okay. I'm really tired. <laughs> I've been going since like super early this morning. And um, um, I'll be going super early tomorrow morning as well. So um uh, yeah, let me just see what the next slide is. Okay, so take a deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. Relax your shoulders. If you find in this moment that your tongue is stuck to the roof of your mouth, let it release. That is the that is the homeostasis of the colonized mind is this tense and stressed and 
you know, there's something to do and we have to go get it. And, you know, I just let go for a second if it's only for this moment um, and just try to try to absorb this song, Ajwayam Nishna, Ajwayam Nishna. Um, have compassion on for me, and I'm going to thanks to the, uh, I'm going to give thanks to the moon, uh, because she is uh, just ending showing her full face to us. And she'll be rising um, just um, about an hour after we finish tonight. And I'm going to give thanks to the sun, because those are two of the um, ancestors, the relatives that we have that we are dependent on for our survival. So that song is a song that can be sung for hours. And sometimes I do when I'm working on the land. I, I, I sing that song and I give thanks. I give thanks for my place here as a human. That these teachings that were uh, shared by our ancestors, that I believe them. I believe them to be true. I believe that our ancestors knew something. They had secrets about the universe and we're awakening them again. We're awakening them by restoring the consciousness that surrounds us, by not destroying it anymore. If we, if we are naive to think that you know, the deer and the wolves and the bears and the eagles and the hawks are not part of our consciousness, then what are we really as humans? And so we teach that the most ancient of our relatives are the minerals. And they made an agreement with the plants. And see, the minerals had to forget everything that they thought they knew. You see, this is connected to our creation story. And at the beginning of our creation story, there's a sound that emerges in the nothingness that was the nothingness which was essentially everything. And in, in that moment, there was something in the nothingness that emerged, something in the every possibility that exists in every nothingness. And that was a sound, shishigwe. 
and I can't sing the song that this is connected to because this is being recorded. But it's so beautiful because it says, Shi Shi Gui Minon Dua Na, to that first sound, I hear you. I remember. And that's why I say, go back to your heart. Because that is the first sound in creation. You are a reflection of the great spirit coming to know itself as the most beautiful being in the whole universe. And it chose this place, Ishkakamakwe, our mother, the earth, to allow its consciousness to evolve to this point. This moment in time that is unlike any other in the history of all the beings who have come and gone before us. And so these consciousnesses emerged over time, billions of years. And every consciousness that emerged had to forget everything that it thought it knew about what it meant to be itself in order for the new iteration of the most beautiful being in the whole universe to come to be. And that is what led to us. And when we came here, we made an agreement with the animals and the plants and the minerals. And we said, we will never take more than we need. We will always give back when we take. And we will honor you in our bodies, in everything that we do. And we're the only ones who forgot. And what my teacher in Guatemala says is that there's a new consciousness emerging. And it's up to us to forget everything we think we know about what it means to be a human. And like, I mean, I'm biased for sure, but <laughs> now is the time. <laughs> now is the time. We are headed for an absolute, utter disaster, and we are going forward towards it at such an incredible rate. It's, it, you know, it's just unbelievable, some of the actions that people are taking at this time. And so where do we start? Well, we start here. Ode. Can you say that? I just encourage you to say Ode. And if you've kind of like, if you're back to homeostasis and you're a little bit tense and you're like, oh, what is this guy talking about? He's crazy. That's okay. I'm still going to leave this room and I will still believe these things I'm telling you. And I will still practice this way of life every day until I no longer have that breath that creation gave me. But we start here. Ode. Ode, Ode, Ode. And from that first point of conception, that is the thing that starts to grow, Ode. And it grows through these two means, through the water, Bish or Nibe, and Wasmu, and this electricity. And so every time that your heart beats, and for some of you, it might be beating a little bit faster right now. Some of you might be uh, asleep, and that's totally okay. <laughs> um, keep absorbing. But these two forces, this electricity and this water, every time your heart beats, it's going through your whole body. I mean, we are a miracle. Human beings are a miracle. But there's more. Because if you look to Ode, you find Ishko De. And Ishko Day is our fire, and our fire is not necessarily the sacred fires. And before all our fires were sacred, we weren't doing weenie roast and marshmallow s'mores. All our fires were sacred. And, and what I'm saying is each one of you is sacred. Each one of your hearts is sacred. And you see, as Anishinaabe, as I told you from the beginning, we are a people that nurtured the hearts of each other. It's in the, 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 the very essence of our language. And you see, ish, ishkode, bish, water. Ish is like the strength. It's, it's not strength like flexing in a mirror, as probably a few of us are guilty of on, on, on occasion. 
okay? It's, it's the movement. It's the actual movement. It's the trail you leave on the earth when, 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 you're, when, you, um, when your spirit finally transcends. What is the trail that you have left? And, and this drum is Odewegen. We're not, we're not drumming because we're childlike. We're drumming because we're remembering our place of origin. We're remembering that each one of us was born of the womb of our mothers through the flood of her waters. And, and the women are held up as sacred. And when we drum, we're drumming because we remember that heartbeat where we stayed for nine months listening. And you see each one of you is a reflection of your mother's heartbeat. But what's even crazier is that for the women in the room, when you were four months developed in your mother's womb, all the eggs that you would ever carry for the rest of your life are already inside of you. And so in essence, all of us are a reflection of our grandmother's heartbeat. Wow. Imagine our children are taught this. Imagine I was taught this as a, at a young age. I think my life would be different. And so what are our villages? What are the places where we gather? Odeana, the places where our hearts gather. What is the strawberry? Odeamin. Odeamin, Manado. Odeamin, Manado. To the spirit of the strawberry. Odeamin, Manado. Odeamin, Manado. Hey, hey. We sing in Odeamin, Manado. We sin in no demon, man at all. We sin in no demon, man at all. We sin in no demon, man at all. To the spirit of the strawberry, I'm going to eat you. <laughs> And that's how we were. That's how we lived. Our lives were a constant dialogue with the spirit of our relations. And uh, if you translate our word for truth, Ode Buewen. Ode Buewen isn't the words you speak because uh, as you guys know full well, the words we speak sometimes do not come out the way that we intend them to. And sometimes they come out exactly the way that we intend them to and they are lies. Just like the lies that the colonizer has told about indigenous people. Ode Buewen, the truth for our people was the actions that you took on, on the land, on the water, in relationship to all of your relatives. And that is how we lived. And that is how I try to live and hopefully will continue to live uh, forever. So there's more. <laughs> I could stop there and maybe that is enough for today, but um, I, I don't know how much time I'm going to have. And uh, what I would like to do is get through just a few more slides because um, I think this is important, but that's what it means to be a human being for us as an Ishnabe, right? The word Medewuin over there, that word literally translates to the sound of the heartbeat of another. And think about all the heartbeats that are around you at this moment or in your circle and not just the ones that are human think about the heartbeat of the bear as it awakens in its dens now think about the heartbeat of maybe you have a dog or a cat and and realize how similar we are <laughs> to our relations we are so much similar than different okay so I teach a 14 week course just on this. And what I want to, oops, sorry. Um, what I want to say is that, you know, our, our 
um, cosmology. I've had these conversations uh, with uh, various religiously indoctrinated people over the course of my uh, career and my life. And I love those conversations. I love having conversations with people who believe in something. And uh, oftentimes I get asked, oh, well, what do you believe in? And it's usually a very condescending, uh, what do you believe in? As if I can summarize in a moment our belief system. You know, but it's not something that can be summarized. That's, again, the colonized mind looking at us and being told we were these primitive people roaming around, ooga, ooga, coming out of freaking caves. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, civilizations larger than any that had, that had existed at the time in Europe had come and gone in North America and so Central and South America long before, you know, these, uh, these so-called heroes arrived. Is it, is it no wonder that most major scientific discoveries uh, were found after meeting indigenous people? There was no... Uh, um, Farming, like you know it today in Europe, prior to colonization, they learned that all from us. <laughs> and how, and what, what scale were we farming at? Well, before I get to that, let's just talk a little bit about global warming. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to escape this for one second because I cannot see my slides because I'm looking at all of you. So I'm going to focus on my slides. Okay. Um, what threat are we facing right now? Well, if we limit to our uh, warming to uh, two degrees, I think the Paris Accord was 1.5, okay? But if we limit to two degrees, which is almost impossible at this point, okay, we are looking at 200 million to a billion climate refugees, 150 million annual deaths from air pollution. And I believe the latest stat was something like 60 million last year, deaths from air pollution. Um, like this is, I mean, it seems insane that I'm saying this, right? It seems uh, like, am I actually saying this? Am I, do I actually have to say these things? But um, essentially for every uh, degree of warming, grain yields will reduce by 10 to 15%. So not only are we looking at an incredible population explosion, uh, we're looking at consumption unlike we've ever seen, and we don't have much left to consume. All our po rivers are poisoned already. Um, what's coming, and it's coming, whether you like it or not, um, will be absolutely catastrophic. Absolutely catastrophic. So please, you have to start preparing. You have to start preparing. I am. And how bad is it? Well, David Wallace Wells, he wrote a book called The Uninhabitable Earth. <laughs> so it's a great book. I really encourage it, uh, but it's really hard to read because I can only take it in chunks because you're just like, no way. We're actually looking at potentially eight degrees of warming and the desertification of the entire planet. Okay, that's what we're looking at right now. We're looking at all the ice caps being gone. I mean, within 20 years, this isn't, 2100 this is now this is now we're in it the the mass extinction event is now okay so but it seemed to me the public simply did not understand the threat we were facing and so maybe i'll do this last because i'm really not sure if i have much more time but um i'll just share this last thing okay so there was a, a study done, I believe, by some scholars in uh, Cambridge in the UK. So they came over to America and they said, what happened? There was this, uh, there was this um, global cooling, the mini ice age. I'm sure you're all learned about it in school at some point. Okay? It lasted between about 1620 to 1820 when the Industrial Revolution um, started to, you know, uh, put CO2 into the atmosphere at rates that had never been seen before and will never, uh, I mean, that are actually have only risen since then. So um, essentially, the indigenous people of uh, the Americas and uh, specifically the current corn belt of the United States were growing around 4 billion hectares of, of land. Okay, So that's an area about the size of France. 
Now, it takes about one acre to feed about 100 people for a year. Okay, so depending on how much land you have, I want you to think about that. If planted right and preserved and taken care of um, um, in, a, in a way that is sustainable, on an acre of land, and I had my students crunch these numbers, um, can, can estimate, sustain 100 people uh, for a year. So 4 billion hectares, well, maybe their, uh, po their estimate, po population estimates of us being like you know, somewhere 6 million, somewhere 10 million. You know, we say we were at least 150 million in North America alone. Okay, and if you consider the size of the, um, the buffalo, okay, the buffalo were in the tens of millions, the herds. I mean, we were living in uh, uh, the kind of world where when the sturgeon um, spawned, we could walk across their backs across a river. Okay. And we probably did. And it was probably pretty fun and pretty scary and like amazing because sturgeon can grow to be 12 feet long if, if you don't over harvest them, which we have. And I probably will never see one like that in my lifetime. Um, essentially, the point of this is that over about 100 years between 1500 and 1600, as the population was decimated, and the story that we we're told, that I was told, was that all oh, those poor Indians, they didn't have immunity to the, those diseases. Well, no one had immunity to these diseases. No one did. Europeans were just immune and rocking around with smallpox. Um, to put this in perspective, it takes a, the fastest ever crossing of the ocean um, in this, this time period was 60 days. That was the fastest ever. Um, the, the average time it took for a ship to cross the ocean was about 120 days. And um, the uh, incubation period for smallpox is something like 30 days where you get the symptoms, you show and you die. Okay, so how did those smallpox get all the way over here? It's just by accident, they didn't, okay? Um, and, and we have to face that reality and how devastating this must have been for the people who are losing entire communities, entire civilizations, and they did, in the tens of millions. For what? So you could spend the next 400 years pillaging and I'm not speaking directly to you. It's just an emotional topic for me. So um, if we were to repeat what happened here, okay, if we were somehow to allow 4 billion hectares of land to grow, go fallow, which is essentially what happened because there was nobody to take care of the land anymore, right? We were engineering huge, huge billions of hectares, right? Um, essentially, if we were be, to be able to somehow allow 4 billion hectares of land to go fallow right now today and create a canopy, we would only reduce global emissions by about 10%. That's what we're facing right now. Um, so I have a whole method that I use is complex and intense. And uh, this is essentially what I'm hoping people will be inspired to do is to actually work on the land and start to restore it and start to restore their communities and work together and, and be together. I worked with a community um, in Kitchener and this is, this, this is just some of the indigenous knowledge that came out of, you know, uh, over the course of a year 60 indigenous leaders coming together and saying, what did we know and what should we remember and what should we teach? And so we had stories about the minerals and the weather and the plants and the trees and the fungi and the birds and the fish and the mammals and the reptiles. We knew them all. Those were our relatives. Of course we knew them. And so if you're wondering what you can do just really practically right now, go out and learn the names of five trees. <laughs> you know, and if you can't name five right now, that's okay. Remember, we have to have compassion because we're just humans. We're the weakest of all the beings. And, and um, no truer is that than just look around what we've done to our planet. Okay. 
So these are all the fun things that can come out of this kind of work. Um, and it is fun. I mean, I'm doing maple harvesting right now. The community has flocked to this place because of COVID. They want the place to be outside. Um, it's just one thing. We're lucky we have a maple forest right here. And um, But you can do canning, dehydration, redistribution. Um, you can have nutritional activities, encourage your people to eat healthy. Um, you can do fruit cultivation, nut cultivation, veggie cultivation. Um, all of these things are what bring a community together, or I've seen bring a community together. Uh, so, and this is just one of the spaces that I um, um, planted and harvested from, and, and now I'm in a new place. So, uh, that's it for me. <laughs> I think I went over time, sorry. But uh, I, I, I'm open to questions, comments. I think we're going to go a different route first. Um, but I just, to all of you who are here, I must just stop sharing this for a second. Oh, I do have my thank you. If you are interested in, in, in learning more, contacting me, I am quite busy. I've done, I think this is my, uh, tomorrow will be the eighth talk I did this month, um, as well as being a full-time professor, as well as teaching as an adjunct at the same time. So I am pretty swamped, um, but I am always uh, willing to do my best to answer requests and um, I'm share with the community that comes, uh, do my best. Uh, but here's my references too. I'm just putting these slides up so that uh, I know this is being recorded. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna stop sharing there. And <laughs> I, don't next, I don't know what's next. I think I wrote it down somewhere, but thank you all. Miigwech, and, and the last thing I'll say, and I know I keep saying the last thing, but the last thing I'll say is this, that miigwech um, is thank you, uh, but it's not thank you because that's English. Just like ode is not heart, ode is that electricity and that water flowing through the body at all times that you know makes you alive and makes you move and, and no one can explain how, right? I mean, you could talk about all the science, but nobody can tell us how that is, right? But um, um, miigwech actually means I have so much, right? This is how thoughtful and mindful we were. It means I have so much I can't possibly take anymore. Miigwech means I have so much abundance, and this would have been our harvest. So when we're harvesting hazelnuts, or miigwech, my baskets are full, miigwech. It's not thank you. It's I have so much I can't possibly take anymore. So um, miigwech to you all, and, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, thank you so much. If we were live, everyone would be clapping, I'm sure, and saying thank you, Andrew. Um, you know, I can listen to you talk forever, and uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone here can, and I'm sure everyone's going to play the recording when they get it, because there's just so much beautiful knowledge that you shared. And, uh, and you're right, it's very powerful. It's so powerful. And you are the people that nourish the hearts of each other and of us, and you've nourished our hearts tonight so much. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Um, I, yeah, well, uh, yeah, thank you. I come say, thank you. Better. Um, yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> You're wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, hopefully we'll have some time for some Q's and A's and, and we can put those in the chat and try and move forward with that as well. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce you to Nicola Thomas to tell you about the good work that she does at Grand River Food Forestry and how she'll be working with you and supporting uh, the faith communities uh, that are participating in this project. Nicola is the founder of Grand River Food Forestry. She's an avid environmentalist who saw an opportunity to encourage communities to steward the soil, grow edibles, and increase pollinator corridors in underutilized green spaces. Through her commitment to increasing community awareness of sustainable ecological land practices, she's been recognized as one of Canada's top 100 Black women to watch in 2016 and a City of Kitchener environmental leader in 2019 and a heart of the city national park delegate. Uh, Nicola has been 
mentored by top permaculturalists from around the world, and she shares her knowledge internationally through educational talks, seminars, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, hands-on practical workshops, consultations, and uh, restorative landscape design. Nicola is absolutely amazing. I am in awe of her deep knowledge and accomplishment, and I'm just thrilled that she'll be working with us on this project. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Nicola, to explain um, what that will look like. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm going to share my screen here and do my best to do that. Let's see how that works. Thank you so much, um, Andrew, for bringing your knowledge. I mean, we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks and still just be touching the surface. So I really appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, as you know, I'm from Grand River Food Forestry and um, our principles are care for the earth, um, care for each other and share the wealth, which is Ujama, which is cooperative economics, shared wealth, and work. So as we gather, let's remember that we're on the land that is the traditional home of many indigenous people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions indigenous peoples and African diaspora peoples of Queensbush Landing have made in shaping and strengthening this community we stand in. So we want to remembering our global indigenous roots and creation stories as a lead into sort of what Andrew was talking about is our agricultural history and how it connects us back to our creation stories, soil and to each other. And all creation stories globally started with minerals on top, then plants, then animals, then us humans. So we are to look upwards for, for our information and our knowledge in land observation, preservation, regeneration and reconciliation. So land management, food hubs and food systems analysis cannot exist without acknowledging the contributions of African diaspora and indigenous histories. So what we're talking about is the impact that has taken on our um, globally, um, uh, the industrial farming has taken on our food prices and on our economies and our health. The UN Food and Agricultural Organization has made a powerful plea many years ago to return to regenerative farming based on agroforestry. Um, Dalhousie and Guelph universities reported over the last few years that uh, we've had an increase in food prices of three to 5%. Now that should give us all pause because it's higher than our inflation rate. In 1965, 4% of the population had chronic illness. Now 46% of children have chronic illness. So urban areas account for nearly 60% of energy use and 70% of CO2 emissions, which is why it's so important that we work in these urban environments. So what is agroforestry? It's a land management approach that uh, purposefully integrates the growing of trees and crops. So it's like the seven layers of the forest that you can see here, that succession planting. So that's the difference between monocultures versus polycultures. A monoculture, as you can see here in the picture at the lavender farm is where you just plant one type of crop. The problem with that is that if you have disease, drought, or any other issues, you lose everything. Whereas if we mimic what a forest does, we have the diversity. And in that diversity, just like in community, it makes us stronger. So, and I, I put these, this slide together. These are all the animals um, and different species that just come to my tiny little postage stamp of a property here. So when we're thinking about what the animals and our relations are and, and, and how we're interacting with them, often we'll just think, well, there's a crow, there's a sparrow, but when you add them all up and see them all together, these are the kinds of species that, that are actively happening on our sites every single day. So the number of wild animals worldwide has halved in the last 40 years alone. So we want to look at these underutilized spaces in land observation, preservation, regeneration, and reconciliation. So what will it take? Um, what if we could be the change to an ecologically sustainable future? What's the recipe? The components, the ideal partners and motivation? How can we expand the agroforestry movement? What can we do? Uh, vision for the future. So we're talking about community capacity building, organizational collaboration through soil education, land stewardship, 
and conservation. The motivation is food security, nutrition, and cash income when plants reach maturity, if that's your way to go. Forests are a habitat to an estimated 80% of the world's biodiversity. Food to wildlife and homes to many pollinator species. Increases soil health for agriculture. Vegetation cools the soil and decreases evaporation, providing shade and humidity. Mitigates climate change by absorbing carbon dioxide, storing carbon, stimulates the water cycle by increasing rainfall and retention in the soil, and, and then also diverting from watersheds. And of course, um, this work crosses barriers of age, gender, culture, and religion. Why? Because everybody eats. So it's something we can all agree on. So what are the components? Uh, the right site, of course, we need the soil ecology. So the soil has to be right to plant in. Permission to plant, proximity to consumers so that they're close to the, what they are growing and to be able to tend it. The right people. So often that's a local champion who's decided to do this. Um, like yourself, some of you that have joined today are gonna participate in these uh, seven uh, faith veggies. Local steward volunteers. Again, the walking distance it has to be close to people. And administrative support. Sometimes when we're thinking about building these sites and uh, increasing biodiversity, we forget that there's administrative things. So even if you're not a person who wants to dig, you could certainly help still. Uh, the right plants. So permaculture, we're talking about biomimicry, mimicking what nature does. Um, local perennial food plants, um, funding and collaboration with local nurseries. So we know that growing food together and sharing, oops, I'm sorry, my bad, and sharing the harvest like breaking bread creates strong social and economical and ecological connections between all of us. So in looking at land, um, we are to think about land observation, preservation, regeneration and reconciliation and how do we do that? So the rights for the site, remembering the ancestral agricultural practices that came before. Um, Queensbush settlement is an example, people connection to land. So relationships to plants and soil as medicine and sacred and not just what they can do for us. So rights for people, food sovereignty, social justice, mobilizing community to ethical land stewardship, educational recreational site resource for children and senior programming. It's cheaper over your lifespan to take care of the food that you eat now and take care of our planet. Chronic illness is very expensive. So, and then the rights for plants, enhanced native plant species that increases our biodiversity, enhanced food and habitat for the wildlife that are here. Restorative and regenerative agriculture equals nutrient dense food, biodiversity, carbon, sequestering. So it's sort of like we have to slow down to speed up. So we need to take note from what plants are doing, slow ourselves down so that we can move forward. So, and what does that look like in site observation? In permaculture, we use a tool like this to look at where the sun is coming to the site, the cold, the hot, and those kinds of things. So utilizing um, energy already, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, my slides are showing up smaller than they are from me. So I apologize if I'm running ahead. Utilize energy already coming into your property. So that's most important. We wanna think about utilizing um, the water, utilize the plants to stop, um, to create wind breaks and those kinds of things. Um, observe how the water runs through your property. You can create swales and do things to hold the water on your site, the sun, the wind, the soil type, animals, noises, and views. You're thinking about how those all affect the site that you're working on. What animals naturally come to your property where and when will give you clues about what type of soil you have and what types of plants you have and, and the, um, the level of the biodiversity wellness. Um, naturalized farm habitat. This is where we want to think about is naturalizing areas so that um, if you think about even 10 years ago when we used to drive and um, we used to get a lot of bugs on the windshield. Do you remember that? We always were wiping away. 
doesn't happen anymore. And that's a direct result of the lack of biodiversity we have in all of these spaces that we've put buildings and not thought about um, insects that are integral um, to our own lives. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure that you can remember because it used to be really irritating when all those bugs used to come to the windshield and, and now I wish they would, you know. So um, how do we do this? Uh, we use a, a technique in um, permaculture called no-till lasagna gardening. And so we're using the biomimicry. So biomimicry is mimicking what a forest does. So if you think about how a forest deals, a forest doesn't go in and till its soil every year to have new plantings. It just keeps adding. And so that's the um, sort of the principles that this works on. It's less work and it actually makes agriculture more accessible to people because it's not as much work. Tilling ruins the soil structure and kills millions of beneficial biotas, which are those insects that we need that are integral in, in creating um, high density nutrient soil. So how we do that is we will plant, um, when we get together, we will plant uh, the, the, the berry bushes and those things into the ground. And around that, we will put the cardboard soaking wet. And what that does is it suppresses the weeds and the grass. Then we'll put a layer of compost on top of that straw and layer it up right into the top where we'll put mulch, which will hold the water um, until we can cover it with ground cover. So now why we put the cardboards, as I said, it suppresses the weeds and the grass, but the no-till comes in because worms um, use cardboard for bedding and they also like to eat it. So that's where they're coming up and they're turning the soil for you. It was a major eureka moment and changed my life when I figured no-till gardening out. So, and what does that mean? What are, the, what are the biotas that are in the soil? In one hectare of soil, contains 15 tons of or beneficial organisms, the equivalent uh, to the weight of 20 cows. Now I'm a visual person, so I always like to see things. So if you think about this teaspoon right here, has millions of bacteria, um, nematodes, anthropodes, and earthworms in it. So when you, you think about if you're tilling with a large shovel, how much destruction that's having under the soil. So in terms of our faith veggies, and hopefully I'll get to see some of you at, uh, at, uh, at these sites. This is a design I put together. Um, we've already ordered most of the plants because as you know, with COVID people are, are, are planting like crazy. Um, and so this, these are the plants that will uh, be a part of the veg that we will be building. We Nicola. have the opportunity to plant fruit trees also, but Nicola. I- your slides aren't changing. Oh, I no. I not interrupt you. It's amazing what you're presenting, but your slides are still on the, we have to slow down to speed up. Oh, okay. Let me see what I can do here. Okay. What do you see now? Still, still the same. Maybe just um, like exit out of the full screen and then come back into it. Okay. I'll try. Or stop sharing and then re Sorry, everyone. It's just Can you see that. It's oh. it's still the same for me. Stuck. Huh. Sorry. I don't really know how to correct that. Um, anybody with any suggestions? Can you minimize, like, or or a stop, like, go to stop share? Okay. And then and then go back into it. All right. Thanks, Andrew. You're welcome. Okay, now let's see if I can go forward now. Do you see yeah, that? It, yeah, it changed. Yeah. Okay, so you see that now? Yeah, I do the agroforestry. Okay, so that's what I was talking about the site observation. This is the no till. So I guess you didn't see the cardboard. You can no, see that. This now. is great, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, this is the, the amount of beneficial insects. And then this is the um, spoon that shows you just how many insects are in there. And then this is the design. Can you see that? 
Yes. Did it change? Yeah. Okay. Looks great. Okay. So that's, this is, thanks Andrew so much for your help. Um, this is the Faith Veg that, uh, design that we have. And these are exactly the plants that will come with each design. Now, as I was saying before, we can put fruit trees in there. Generally, um, I don't put fruit trees in unless we have a champion to take care of them. Because when we're dealing with these, I am always using perennial plants that I know do very well in this environment and as many native plants as we can do. Um, that being said, fruit trees take a little bit extra effort. So if there is um, any of your groups that decide that you do particularly want fruit trees and you can take care of it, I can give you links. There's a great company um, organization in Toronto called the Orchard People, and they know all things um, to do with fruit trees. So we can add that. And then also to say that we're going to, this is, the site is usually about 250 square feet. We usually put it into a very sunny spot, um, depending on, we, we will look at each of the sites to determine whether um, it's gonna be a good fit for the veg. And then also for those people that are considering it for their site, um, I'd like you to also consider that this could be just the beginning of something else that you're doing. So I'm going to show you this slide of um, this is actually um, Mill Cortland Community Center. I created a five year site map for them. And so far, we've gotten this far in about three years. So they still have this part to do. I don't know if you could see my cursor. Um, and this part, but then it's entirely up to them based on funding that they get and volunteers that they have. And then, um, and, and also the other thing is, is that when we come and we do these veggies, the idea is that do you then know how to do this so that you can then go to your site and share with your family and friends this, this type of um, technique that is really great for environment. Um, and so, at, commu at uh, Mill Cortland Community Center, they can carry on themselves, although they, they're wonderful and I, I'm, I'm very connected to them. So my, I would always show up for them anyways. Um, but they do have the capacity now. And this is what we're trying to do is connect people to soil, connect people to understand soil and um, care for it so that we have a chance. As Andrew said, it's looking pretty brief. Um, we've worked with a number of different types of organizations. In this particular case, we'll be working with churches. Um, and um, I encourage everybody to try to promote this movement. Do what you can. Even one square foot helps in terms of biodiversity. Um, let's do everything we can. Be the seed that starts in your community. Every new location needs a champion make connections, build momentum, and coordinate projects. Um, social permaculture for nurturing effective groups through harvesting, cooking together. Look for opportunities. Um, there are so many right now because we are in a really bad situation. So there's city climate change policies, there's funding there, land development, underutilized green spaces. Um, and then thinking about children. We used to say children are our future and somehow we decided to drop that, that buzz line. I'd like to bring it back because it's the truth. If we don't include them, um, we really don't have a future. So educate, involve them. You can find them at your local community, your church or your school. Inspire, motivate and support these ambassadors. If we wanna think back to when we first got in our lockdown last year and we were all in pause, what happened to the planet while we paused? Um, air pollution levels plummeted, animals reclaimed the land, people reconnected with each other, people reconnected with nature in very big ways. Um, the Himalayas became visible and dolphins swam in the canals. So it's really about us slowing down and look at what happens when we do nothing at all. You know, nature has a way of taking care of itself. And if we could look to nature um, for our guides, uh, this is, I think this is sort of what Andrew was talking about as well, is that we, we would um, give ourselves a better chance if we, if we looked at ourselves at the bottom of that list. The garden, gardeners are the guardians. So when you're taking care of your small space, even if you're not planting edibles and you're planting um, 
whatever you're planting there, we need that because we need the insects and we need the biodiversity and we need people to care. Live closer to your food. Some of you might've noticed that I put the sustainable goals. Um, agroforestry actually hits all 17 sustainable development goals. Um, have fun in nature. There's lots of fun to be had out there. Get out there, do some fun things. Um, our vision is land observation, preservation, regeneration, and, let, and reconciliation through land acknowledgement, food security, sovereignty, and justice for all. We invite you to join us. Together, we have the capacity to create a resilient and restorative ecological future for all of our relations. Thank you so much. Ubuntu Asante. Thank you so much. That was just beautiful. Thank you. What a night. Um, thank you, Nicola. Seriously, that was great. Um, so this is what you're in store for with the Faith Food Forest. Um, we're going to tell you how you can um, be part of this project. Um, it turns out that um, supplies cost a bit more. And so uh, I think it looks like we're going to do seven uh, uh, faith communities this year. But um, you know, as Nicola said, there's a lot of um, opportunity for you to continue and to grow these. And if this project works out well, I really hope it does. We'll continue to um, ask for support to expand it uh, in years going forward, just because it's such important work. So before I get to the last bit where I tell you um, how you can um, uh, get engaged with the expression of interest and, and be part of this, I just wanna very quickly talk about climate justice. I know we're running uh, a bit over time. This is just uh, about five minutes um, because this all ties together. And we know that the climate crisis, we talked about it tonight, uh, it's increasingly shaping headlines and political debates and daily conversations and the impact on our national or natural uh, world are what it's, it's widely understood. And, um, and we also understand that it's a, high, uh, a human rights issue. It's an urgent human, human rights issue. And the human rights are intimately linked to the crisis. It's about the rights of future generations to life and health, food, water, housing, and livelihoods. And it's also about the lives of so many people right now, especially those with the least access to resources. Um, I'm sure folks here are plugged in and you'll remember the May 2019 UN report that warned that without a radical reordering of society, pretty powerful language, away from runaway consumption, the planet faces irreversible calamity. The report told us that a million species are on the brink of extinction and human survival depends on these species. And Andrew told us, we, we know we're in the sixth mass extinction, it's begun. And the report showed us that over the last several years, sea level rise, planetary warming, shrinking ice sheets and carbon pollution have all increased. And the Secretary General of the United Nations has just recently issued yet another sobering call to action for our political leaders, saying that the decisions that we make now will determine the course of the next 30 years and beyond. He said globally, emissions must fall by half by 2030 and reach net zero emissions no later than 2050 to achieve the 1.5 degree Celsius goal. The science is clear. If we fail to meet these goals, the disruption to economies, societies, and people caused by COVID-19 will pale in comparison to what the climate crisis holds in store. And so our shared responsibility is equally clear. We double our efforts to recover from the economic and social crisis and get on track to build a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient future. This will require an unprecedented mobilization by all of us. Global solidarity is imperative to defeat the virus and recover better. We can be encouraged by the growing number of countries that are committing to the net zero target. The European Union has pledged to become the first carbon neutral continent by 2050 and has aligned its COVID-19 recovery package with that objective. And at long last, Canada has introduced legislation to join more than 120 other countries that have pledged to carbon neutrality by 2050, including several other G7 nations such as the UK and Germany, Italy, France, and Japan, as well as hundreds of cities around the world, including Guelph, Halifax, Hamilton, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, but not the region of Waterloo. 
And so I'm asking everyone here tonight to please weigh in on the regional climate action strategy. It's on Engage Waterloo Region, and you can make comments and tell them what you think about it until April 12th. And we should commend the regional staff and the good people at Climate, Water, or climate Action Waterloo Region for including a wide range of good proposals in this strategy, but the targets are lacking the necessary ambition that the climate science has confirmed. And the global imperative is to set a short-term reduction target of 50% by 2030, not uh, and, and net zero by 2050 not a 30% reduction by 2030 as proposed by the region and not an 80% reduction uh, by 2050 as proposed in our regional target. When it's clear that the world as a whole needs to reach 50 by 30, there is simply no excuse for a prosperous, innovative region like ours not to step up and commit to achieve that target. Together we can stand with indigenous people and the most affected by the crisis and demand a rapid and a just transition to a zero, zero carbon economy that leaves no one behind. This is a powerful opportunity for us to collectively show the decision makers locally that it is the love that we have for each other and our love for creation and for peace that compels us to take action on climate change. And we've got that. It's, it's less than three minutes, uh, a video of people in our community who are supporters of 50 by 30 and this target who are reaching out uh, to our municipal councillors to tell them this. And we're just gonna play it really quickly and then we'll get back and we'll tell you uh, how you can jump on board with this project. Kai, can you set that up? Uh, yep, just one minute. Thanks. And you'll see some familiar faces, I think, too. Okay, hopefully you can hear this now. It's gonna take one minute to load. Right here in Waterloo, I'm concerned about the pandemic we are facing in the form of a climate emergency. This emergency will not only affect our environment, but will negatively impact our physical and mental health with heat waves, vector-borne diseases, and diseases related to carbon pollution. We see this as a unmitigated catastrophe when it comes to public health. We need to take the appropriate action now. We require just and equitable solutions in order for us to ensure a sustainable future for our families, our communities, and the environment. Climate change is undoubtedly one of the most pressing existential threats that we face today. Without immediate action, we risk missing the critical window we have now to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. Climate change is a problem that is produced globally but solved locally, and I'd be proud to live in a region that is at the forefront of this inevitable change. Now, I recognize that this type of a commitment always raises concerns about the impact on economic development, but I can assure you that there are businesses just like ours that are ready to bridge that gap and work with developers to ensure that they can achieve these targets without impacting their construction budget. Reducing emissions, reducing negative impact doesn't have to be seen as a sacrifice of uh, losing our quality of life. It can be um, a push towards a more creative, beautiful, sustainable, interconnected way of living. And that's something that I think we would all gain um, tremendously from. Of course, Waterloo Region can't do it all on its own. But by setting that kind of target and by taking urgent policy measures to move towards it, we, along with other communities all across Canada, will be sending a powerful message to our provincial and federal leaders that the time for baby steps is over. The time for dramatic, meaningful climate action is now. There is nothing subjective about this. I support a 50 by 30 target in Waterloo Region because this is the minimum target scientists tell us is required to sustain human life on this planet. We have a history of doing our part in this community. Let's not stop now. Our community is ready with solutions. We have many green organizations within our region. Let's partner and be the region that leads the nation into an ecologically, economic, sustainable future for all our relations for generations to come. 
Asante Ubuntu. Thanks, Kai. So hopefully that inspired you. There are so many more videos and I, I know a number of people that are on this call today uh, have, uh, have contributed videos and there's longer ones and shorter ones and you can, you can still make one and send it in. There's a, a 50 by 30 Waterloo region campaign. Um, Kai and I are actively engaged in that as our uh, other folks on this call today. So we're asking you to please join that campaign, learn how um, uh, you can encourage our region to be led by climate science and to do our fair share. So Kai, um, hopefully you can put that in the chat right now. I'm sure you can Google us 50 by 30 Waterloo region, but you can put the link in and we'll include something in the follow-up. Um, to this um, uh, meeting as well. So now uh, I can tell you uh, about how to be part of this project. Next steps, we'll be sharing a very simple expression of interest form um, along with the link to the recording of this event so that um, for all the folks who missed it, I'm feeling really bad about that. And, uh, and so that you can watch um, the beautiful words and uh, that were shared tonight and, and really feel them, let them sink in again. Um, so we'll be sharing all of that. You can complete the expression of interest form. It, it's, a, it's a very, very simple form where basically, um, if you want to participate, uh, you can tell us the name and address of your faith community, why you want to participate in the project, and how you will engage your neighbors. The idea is that everyone uh, can have access to this food. It's not just for the folks who happen to be part of your community, but it's for your neighbors. It's for everyone. And, and we really want that to... Um, uh, yeah, so that's part of this. Um, and uh, we need you to confirm that you can host Nicola uh, to provide a workshop for your faith community and for your neighbors. And um, given the current restrictions, that will probably probably be a Zoom uh, event and uh, we can help you with that. We'll have the technology sorted by then. Um, if, you, if you can't do that on your own, we can get folks who can help you. Um, and you'll also need to confirm that you're able to have 15 volunteers who are available for three hours to prepare the soil and to plant uh, in June, sometime in June. It could be during a weekday, a weekday evening, early a weekday evening, um, or it could be on a weekend. Um, and we're also asking that you can contribute uh, $400 to the cost of your fedge. That's noting that the total cost of each of these fedge, fedges um, uh, for all the plants and the soil augmentation and for Nicola's consulting to plan it and site it and work with you and do all of that is $2,400. So just to be clear, the region of Waterloo through the Community Environment Fund is contributing $2,000 toward each veg and we're asking that you contribute uh, $400. And we are extremely grateful to the region and to the environmental fund managers for their generous support for this project. See, we can actually, you know, work with the region and, and encourage ambition and still at the same time be very, very thankful for their support. Um, so that's how it will work. Uh, Nicola will be with you uh, for the whole journey. As I said, she'll, she'll meet with each of your groups, um, explain the process and, and dive deeper into some of the subjects that she covered today. She'll be with you on the day uh, that the plants arrive and that she do the planting. And she'll give you ideas about how you can uh, expand this going forward and support that work and how you can find funding to continue that work. So really, this is just the beginning. Um, we didn't have, um, you know, normally in an event like this, we would have an evaluation on your seats that we'd ask you to complete before you leave. So if you could just take a minute and put a comment or two in the chat um, that we can include as our evaluation. Um, or in our evaluation, that would be helpful because um, we did report back, we did commit to reporting back to the region um, uh, that we would find out what you thought of, uh, of this evening. And thank you all for your time and for your commitment toward working toward a better world. And thank you to our amazing speakers tonight. Um, it's truly, it's just been marvelous to hear all of you, um, Michelle and, and uh, Andrew and Nicola, thank you all. It's just been wonderful. And thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. What a great night. Such wonderful people. Thank you. You're all the best. Go spread the word. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Ed, sing us out. <laughs> You're all the best. Go spread the word. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. Maybe, maybe we need to ask Andrew to add his drum. <laughs> oh my gosh. Love you guys. Oh, okay. Ciao. Ah, right on. Guys. <laughs> wow, so beautiful.